Okay, so now from Arizona, let's go a few thousand miles away to the border region of Afghanistan and Pakistan. When you see this map, right, just take a moment. What comes in mind? I know. Wars, conflicts, extremism, Taliban, right? But today, I'm not talking all about that. I'm sharing a different story, taking you on a different journey. There is a lot more than wars and conflicts there. There are lots of stories of hope, resilience, and positive social change in this region. I want to take you to my village and my city on the border of Afghanistan and Pakistan. That's Peshawar. We call it Hukula uh, Peshawar. And it's part of the Silk Road. And uh, it witnessed lots of wars and conflicts. Many superpowers came to this region, to this land, because this was Silk Road and a gateway to subcontinent from Central Asia. So people have witnessed lots of wars throughout. And recently, Soviet Union, and then UK, UK and Soviet, Soviet Union, and then US, and all those conflicts, and they were retreated. And, but there was lots of disaster throughout in the region due to these conflicts. And one obvious consequence of conflict is chronic underdevelopment in the region throughout. As I promised, I'm taking you on a different journey. This is the journey of my grandfather. Despite all what was going on around the region, the community found this man. This one man who was different, who stood for gender justice, who rejected existing gender norms, who said clear and loud to the community that I am going to treat my daughters as I treat my sons. My daughter is going to eat whatever my sons will eat. My daughter will go to school because my sons are going to school. He was a different man. One man, one tribal man, one Pashtun man was this time on the girl's side, on his daughter's side. There was some resistance, my mom told me. But he stood up and he made sure that his daughters goes to school. My mom would say that he would, my, my uncles would always complain that our father always loved his daughter more than us. So he would, the grandfather, my grandfather, would arrange this horse buggy for his daughter in the village so they can go safely to, that, uh, to, to school. And uh, they will cover the horse buggy on the back side because tribal, there was a resistance that no one can see, no one should see girls and women, right? So he, he will arrange this and his daughters will go to school. So <clears throat> my mom become the first educated girl in the community, in the tribe. The first woman to be educated. And then she taught for, she didn't stop then. She taught for 25 years in the region. And these are her, her beautiful students, resilient students with her, uh, probably they won some some award or something. And <clears throat> I remember as a child, 
the struggles of my mom, the first educated woman in the tribe, in the region, and the struggles, she was the first one to wake up in the morning making breakfast for everyone, we four tigers, four sons, and then she's running to school to teach the last one to go to bed. And she struggled a lot throughout, but she, she was passionate about girls' education because it was meaningful for her and the family. She became the role model for the whole community. And I learned and witnessed the power of knowledge gained by a woman and the power of dignity of men when they stand with women through my mom. My friends, our, uh, we were happy. Our life was getting better. Gender justice and girls' education, all those issues, we were gradually developing. Right? In our own way, we had a colonial history. We were negotiating with our colonial history. But we were growing in our own way. We were progressing in our own way, in our own natural way, negotiating with the roots, our roots and our colonial history. As a child, I remember that uh, there was an increase in girls' schools, a gradual increase, a natural increase in girls' schooling. There were openness around gender justice in the community. Religion, religious leaders were more into bringing peace and harmony and that spirituality and healing processes. This is, this is what I remember. I remember these kind of events where girls would have celebrations, events, and they'd be going there and they'd be having fun together. So they were celebrating life in their own way. And I can witness the progress going on in our communities. But our world, our dreams were shattered. Proxy wars, Cold War, Soviet invasion, American coming after them, our region, our region become a place for wars of global powers. I witnessed that. I was on the border of Afghanistan and Pakistan. What is war look like? The human suffering, the suffering of women and children, the abuse of dignity of humans. I witnessed that. Everything got sh shattered. The progress stopped, but war is just not war the social fabric of society got broken. Extremism, religious extremism was intentionally, intentionally introduced to the region by global powers. So people can fight Russian effectively because religion could be a good source to use for that purpose. Religion was not that extreme. It was made extreme through policies by international community and through global powers in the region. But even in those times, war kind of situation, people, many community members, peace-loving people, they did not stop, they continued in their own ways. Social workers continued in their own ways to find, to give some healing, to find some ways to progress. I was one of them, of many community members who were thinking like that. And I chose my PhD topic with all these questions. Why? 
Women were, are the ones who suffer throughout in wars and conflicts and through patriarchy. And how to, how to break this vicious cycle which, which is going on in my region. So, I had a job now. I had to do something about it. And I said, who I will go to? And I said, I am going to listen to the community and to collect those pearls of wisdom from the community going into the field throughout in the region and find out what are the solutions about gender justice, about girls' education, promoting girls' education. And in all those pearls of wisdom, if there, if there is one I can share with you today, is engage the gatekeeper. I call it the gatekeepers. Engage men. Just women approach are, is not going to work unless men's perceptions, attitude, and behaviors are changed. Unless men become strong ally in the struggle, in the goals of gender justice, it will be an uphill battle. And with that, how to constructively engage men? And in that context, Pashtun men, how to constructively engage, engage them? So we developed a model. And then I <clears throat> basically document that model. Uh, and, but, but at the same time, we did not stop there. We, we just applied that model. It is now translated in, uh, in local languages. <clears throat> so we applied that, this model of how to constructively engage men. And there are few, few key pieces I want to share with you quickly. We go to those communities. We talk to those men in a respectful manner by looking into their cultural context, their religious context. We go and we, we, we meet religious leaders. We talk to village councils. We use existing respected cultural institution, hujra and mosque. So we, we trust them. We believe their views. We respect their thoughts, their values, their voices, and their dreams. We, we are going there not as a teacher, not as an NGO worker, but as a learner, as a student. And they open up. And they share their thoughts. And then they find out their own solutions. And we go there and we work with them through those solutions. One important piece while doing all this work in this region, I learned that they won't come to you. They won't come to you. They won't listen to you if you are imposing views. They will listen to you when you offer a safe and brave space for them with respect and with honor. One other thing that we learned that is that find those, I call them beautiful men. In every village I traveled, across Pakistan in this region. In every village, with all difficulties, I always found few men, few role models who are standing with women, who are standing with their daughters. They want to support them. They want to become a strong ally. And I begin with those men, with those few men. Here is a man. His name is Mia Khan from Afghanistan. Every day he is taking his three daughters on his bike to school. And then he is bringing them back. And there's another man from Pakistan. He's taking his little daughters to school. 
They, they are there and we can begin with those men. So this the the key lesson that I learned and I want to share this with you that when we go there and we ask them that what are the solutions and we follow those solutions then they they love it then because it's their solutions they own it the change the social change is coming from within now now the community is owning it they are loving it they are embracing it then they say that this is ours we did it we did it and then the beautiful baba is so proud and and he takes his daughter with love with pride and with trust thank you